Sayoko, I'm John Kane, and I welcome you to Let's Talk Native on this Saturday, February 1st, 2020. While this program may not provide a path to spiritual enlightenment, we do encourage and in some cases start conversations. We kind of break the rules here for Native Radio. We don't do uh, prayers or Buffalo speeches. We take a tough look at history, oppression, in survival, we talk about culture, the arts, politics, and identity, and we may step on a few toes along the way. But our real goal here is to bring people together by breaking down what separates us. We take on the false narratives and provide critical thinking to all the deceived upon us, and we do it all right here, live from the Cattaraugus territory of the Seneca Nation. So let's talk Native. But first, let me remind people that our audio streams on our website, which is www.letstalknative.com. We stream video of the show on Facebook Live on our Facebook group pages. And uh, we, take the, we take the audio and put it up on SoundCloud, which also puts it up on all your, your favorite podcast platforms. And we got some good numbers in from iTunes and Spotify and from, uh, from Google Podcasts. Uh, so keep it going. Keep, uh, you know, keep looking at your, uh, at your favorite platform, encouraging people to, uh, to subscribe to our podcast. Uh, I also want to encourage you to uh, subscribe to our YouTube channel. We take the video of these shows and we put it up on our YouTube channel. Plus, we produce short-form videos that I encourage you to take a look at and share. This is The whole point is to, is to spread some information, have some conversations that perhaps you haven't heard before, encourage you to continue those conversations. That's what we do here. I'm John Kane, and I am the host of Let's Talk Native. I'm joined here in studio uh, by Jake Proud, who is managing our audio and our video. Um, thanks for joining us. All right. As per a request, I'm actually uh, doing a show uh, based on a meme that I posted recently. And, and I've talked about decolonization quite a bit. But I posted a meme last week, and I said, you know, decolonization isn't just about finding a comfortable uh, place within the systems of oppression. It's about dismantling and untangling ourselves from those systems of oppression. So um, one of our listeners uh, or, or viewers on Facebook, whatever, uh, said, when are you going to talk about that specifically as it relates to Ongwe Ongwe? Well, I, I do all the time, but... You know, I had a guest join me in, in New York on, on Thursday, um, Leon Su, who is the um, Foreign Affairs Minister for the Hawaiian Kingdom. And we talked a little bit about decolonization because most people don't realize, but one of the main functions in, in, uh, in the formation of the United Nations was to address this, uh, the imperialism, the colonialism that was, you know, so rampant throughout the world uh, and had so many... Uh, places living under colonial rule. And so this idea of decolonization from a UN standpoint was about trying to uh, work uh, towards helping these um, British colonies, these US colonies, these Spanish colonies be, uh, become independent, become uh, you know, nation states, if you will. The problem is that they obviously didn't, you know, didn't address places like Hawaii or, or certainly, you know, uh, very few, if any, uh, of the um, the peoples that were colonized by the United States. Certainly, none within the continent of North North America. Native people didn't even blip on the radar. But the other problem is that they concentrated more on this idea of statehood and um, and nationhood and independence, and less about stripping away. The colonial systems. So many of these nations that um, that found themselves asserting independence were doing so all with the same systems of oppression that their, their colonizers had, had imposed upon them. You know, I've got to take another um, a couple looks, I guess, or, or conversations about the doctrine of Christian discovery because one of the things that we don't talk about that much is how much of the legacy of the doctrine of Christian discovery is that there's so much that, that some of the very people who were oppressed under this, this church dogma would be converted. I mean, you, you look across all the brown people of, uh, of South and uh, Central America, South America, um, they're predominantly Catholics. And, and, and I'm not saying they all are, but predominantly um, uh, all of the, the people who were enslaved uh, under uh, this idea of the doctrine of Christian discovery, black people are, are very, very Christian um, native people look here in Cataraga. I think there's seven churches here, five churches or something like that. Even in Onondaga, this so-called bastion of traditionalism, they've got several churches down there. tonawanda has got a big church. I mean, these, so, so the legacy of 
not just the doctrine of Christian discovery, but the, the colonization that comes with that, that, that is a part of that, is that their assimilation worked. We have many Native people throughout the world who were, were oppressed in the name of the church who would become part of those churches. And so when I talk about decolonization from a Native standpoint, I'm not just talking about asserting sovereignty in some form or trying to become a nation state within the international definition of, of what nationhood is. Uh, I'm not against that, but the, the, the more important part about decolonization is stripping away the systems of oppression. Because if you, you know, if you're going to claim that you're, that you're working towards decolonization and you want to use, <laughs> you're saying, well, yeah, well, I'm all for decolonization, so let's be counted in the census and go vote in the elections. Wait a second. That doesn't even make sense. You know, I, <laughs> I clown around. I put some memes up that are supposed to be funny and thought-provoking, and the one I put up with the Star Wars characters is that, uh, uh, that suggests, okay, we're all in agreement. We're going to join the empire and fix it from within. Said no rebel ever. And, and, and that's the point that, that I'm saying about decolonization. Decolonization is not about finding comfortable places within those systems of oppression. It's dismantling the systems as they exist on our territory. Look, I'm not trying to dismantle the U.S. system for U.S. citizens. If, if, look, if you're happy with the president you got, if you like what this, this uh, you know, impeachment stuff if you like all of you know the electoral college and uh rural states having as many senators as uh, as you know states that are popular if you like all that stuff then then more power to you i just don't want those systems um being adopted by our people and and what happens is oftentimes when we look at trying to fix a problem we end up mirroring the very things that the uh that the united states has been imposing upon us that hasn't worked. We, uh, you know, I, I saw recently this, uh, you know, somebody trying to explain why we don't have taxation on our territory. Not because we're, we're culturally opposed to it. They, they come up with some, you know, some like there's, like we're not sophisticated enough to have taxation. Well, I would, I would argue that we're too sophisticated to have this idea of stripping away and fleecing the, the general public. But we, we look at, I mean, the tobacco issue, you know, one of the solutions that they thought here in Seneca Nation was, OK, we're going to stamp the cigarettes the, the way the state does. So you're going to you're going to adopt the systems that you opposed. And, and that, that's what doesn't make sense to me. If we want to come up with solutions for the problems, we shouldn't look to the solutions that haven't been working, you know, with, with the, you know, incredible resources of the United States can often doesn't, but can uh, throw at some of these systems. The judicial system sucks. The, the electoral system sucks. I mean, and yet we want to have elections and we, and we want to have courts that look like theirs. We want to have police that look like theirs. We want to have um, maybe perhaps, you know, a child services that look like theirs. Look, I don't mind taking some of the things that they do that work. I mean, I don't have a problem going to a dentist at the, at the clinic and having somebody use what is accepted practices on how to take care of teeth and even some of the medical service. I think there are some, there are some alternatives that uh, should be pursued a little bit more diligently. And I'm not criticizing the Seneca Nation Clinic by any means, but, but the idea of adopting their system, we, we convince ourselves that to have success, <laughs> however we're going to measure that, is that we got to get educated by white people. We place a higher priority on, on a white man with a, you know, with a company or with a degree, we, we, we hire consultants and lawyers and lobbyists and, and, and all of these folks because we have a certain sense of um, inferiority that, that we need to have white people do it. When the, when the Seneca Nation was looking at the possibility of doing a school, they hire some white schoolmaster and, and paid him some ungodly amount of money to develop a school. We, we don't look at, okay, we have a problem with the way the school system works. So we don't dismantle the systems, we just replicate them. So, so the very concept of, of decolonization from a native standpoint is perhaps different than the way the UN approached decolonization or the way um, somebody tries to break away or secedes from, uh, you know, from colonial rule. 
and, and the the irony is many of these countries that would uh, w would fight for independence would still be filled with the colonizers. They would just be civilian or citizens of this of this new nation state, even though they were they were really British or Spanish or whatever else. I mean, look at South America. All of these countries that that you know were once under Spanish rule have still have predominantly in their political systems white people of Spanish or, or Portuguese uh, ancestry. I mean, they may be Brazilian, they may be Venezuelan, they may be Chilean, but if you, if you look at the, the battle between indigenous people like Evo Morales and the, and the woman who's, uh, who's claiming to be the, the legitimate president now, yeah, she's a little whiter than he is. And she's Bible-toting, She's got the support of the United States, you know, another imperial power. So the whole idea is, is, to, is to dismantle the systems and, or, and as, as they are imposed upon us, untangle ourselves from it. And, and, and again, if there's something that seems to work, I still think that we have to do more than just put a native label on it. You, you can't just, you know put a high and want the belt on, on a police uniform and say, oh, there, we have native police now. I mean, you can't just, you know, put a, put a nice native logo on the side of a cop car and say, okay, there, see, now we're, um, um, we're sovereign. No, you're replicating the same thing. You've got a guy carrying a club and a, sometimes a gun. I mean, up in St. Regis, those aren't even native police. They're, they're, they're off. I mean, they're state, they're sheriffs. They are uh, deputized by the, by the counties. And, and many of them aren't native. And if they are native, they're enforcing state law. So and if you're going to replicate their systems and impose their laws and their rule on our territory, well, that's not sovereignty. I mean, and if you want to look to native leadership, the idea of native leadership should be people who are going to lead and empower native people, not try to get elected into the white system. Deborah Halland is not... A congressman isn't my congressman. She's a congressman for a specific district where she was voted in primarily by white people in New Mexico. So who does she represent? She, I mean, look, I'm, I'm, I'm not opposed to her being elected or, or anybody who runs, any native person, but because I'd rather, I, I guess I'd rather see them than a white person. But... They don't represent us once they, once they join that system. They represent somebody else. I mean, so there, there seems to be a, a, a complete disconnect from those people who think that we need to assert ourselves as the distinct people and yet eradicate our distinction. I mean, I, you know, I hate to, you know, I hate to either promote or, you know, give more publicity to somebody like Mark Charles, but this guy d does these TED Talks talking about the doctrine of discovery and rather than understanding that what the doctrine of discovery violated was our free and independent existence and so what does he say the solution is to be absorbed into the american system to be part of we the people and all the while he's he's a calvinist minister so if, if you are going to look at your dis, at your distinction and say the solution is to make it go away. Look, that's why generations of our, uh, you know, before us thought it was better that we didn't learn our language. I mean, there was a conscious decision. My father's generation, all of all my aunts and uncles spoke Mohawk. They made a conscious decision not to teach the children. Why? Because they thought it was a handicap. They didn't think that the language would ha would would benefit um, the next generation. Now, having said that, I also have to bring up something else. Oftentimes I hear, oh, the reason that we have the problems we have is because people don't understand the language. Well, I'm sorry. We had generations of people who spoke nothing but, uh, but our native languages that got screwed left and right. It, it, you know, with, with three, now, <laughs> and it wasn't because we didn't understand English too. I mean, it might not have been, you know, uh, you know, we may not have been as fluent in English as we were in our native tongue, which is part of the problem. But to, but to say that it was our native tongue that, that uh, if, if we all understood our language, we, we would have known better. No, we look, we lost people to, to 
um, to slavery, to, to, uh, to genocide, to, uh, to assimilation. Who had the language? In fact, we, we have to take some ownership even on the residential schools because Native people were complicit in some of those. I mean, we, we knew that our kids were losing the language. And look, we, we may, I mean, I just showed the film uh, Indian Horse in, in New York. And by the way, I want to thank all of you who came out. We had a great crowd. It was, uh, it was pretty much a packed house. And, you know, the, the, the movie starts with a, with a grandmother who's trying to protect a kid, her, her grandsons from um, being, you know, ripped away, kidnapped to go to these uh, residential schools. Where the parents were a little bit more indifferent about, it. they were they were already you know into the bottle and into the Bible and all that other stuff. The grandmother not so wasn't, but oftentimes you got to go back a couple of generations. You know, I I know people who had solid um, a solid foundation laid laid down by grandparents, folks like Dagarun de Gay, and and uh, you know, so he had the benefit of having um, grandparents, a grandmother in particular, who. Uh, who who kept him uh, grounded with you know w with language, culture, um, you know philosophy and all that stuff. But unfortunately, mo most of us ha you have to go back more than just a, a, to our grandparents' generation to, to know that to have that. And so when you're talking about multiple generations of assimilation, and part of this was tied to the residential schools, but some but a lot of it was tied to the fact that. Our, we had already we had already been so compressed onto small pieces of land that we no longer could sustain ourselves within our own territory. So we had to go out into the world. So we had to become the iron workers. We had to find other professions. Uh, oftentimes, just being laborers or service in in some service industry. And there, our distinction was a problem because we we had to, we were working for white people. But today. As, as we try to, you know, draw a line in the sand and, and, and talk. Now, when we talk about decolonization, we better be talking more about just autonomy. And I, and I talk a lot about autonomy and sovereignty and that kind of stuff. Even though the word sovereignty, I don't even think is, a, is the most appropriate word. Because sovereignty is about power. It's not about independence. You know, the, the sovereign is, is, is the... Is whatever it is the te the entity the you know the government whatever that has the power sovereignty is about um, power over people and that's not what independence is but you know again I have to go back to this to this notion about being a free and independent people because if we don't strip away those systems of oppression if we just grab them and make them ours then we're not really free. We're still living under those same systems, even if we're the ones that are implementing those systems. If, if we think that, uh, that the systems that have failed us are going to be better just because we operate them, that doesn't even make sense. We need to have Seneca solutions to Seneca problems. We need to have Mohawk solutions to Mohawk problems, Oneida solutions to Oneida problems. Missing and murdering indigenous women. Anybody who thinks, well, the whole thing is we got, we've got to get, uh, you know, Congress to pass more laws. Bullshit. We need to step up. We need to address these problems. We need to create better hope and prosperity in our territories so we don't have people uh, engaging in risky behavior. We don't have people thinking that the only way to have success and, and have a meaningful life is to leave. Because a lot of what happens to our people starts by people wanting to leave our territories, by being, be, by being miserable, unhappy on, on, in, in our communities. <clears throat> whether we're unhappy with our own quote-unquote tribal government, whether we're unhappy because of the poverty or the racism, or whether we're unhappy because, you know, we, we've, we've got a, a smartphone, we've got cable TV, and we see what everybody else has that we don't. So maybe it's just envy because of stuff that we don't have. So we look at our poverty and what, the, and what, and what that deprives us of. And I'm not even saying that, that that's, that's the good solution, but, but that may be part of it. So how do we convince our people to have you know, a, a higher quality of life and have a life that's, that's more about the pursuit of happiness rather than the pursuit of wealth? And I'm not saying that being, having a little more affluence doesn't, you know, can't help. But if, if you're only going to measure success by dollars and cents, then 
we're still going to we're still going to have that pipeline where our people are, are just leaving. We're going to have an exodus on our territory. And you know what you know what happens is the ambitious ones leave. So the ones that stay are the ones who either can't leave. I mean, I, I remember when Hurricane Katrina hit and um, it 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 forced people to leave New Orleans, the 12th Ward and, and all, of, all of that. And, you know, they could have fixed those communities. But until something forced um, everybody out, I mean, it, it costs more money to do it the way they, uh, you know. And you know what? M many of those people never made it back. So you force people out of an impoverished situation through, you know, in, in this situation because of well, you want to, what, severe weather or climate change. But there was never an effort to fix the, the inequities uh, and, and the poverty associated with those people. I, I've heard, heard people say, well, you know, it, it's a, it was good for New Orleans. Yeah, it, it, why? Because you were able to use, use an act of nature to rid yourself of a whole class of people. And that's just wrong. I mean, it's wrong if you do it with marching in, in there with, with military. And it's wrong if you, you know, create essentially weak infrastructure so nature will do it. And that's no different than, than, than handing out disease blankets. Look, decolonization, for one thing, is, is not even an all or nothing proposition, uh, proposition. These are things that we can all take steps towards. We can... We can look at the systems that fail us and, and just start there. Look, we, we don't have to create communities based. You know, I know there's money, right? There's money involved. Oh, we got to do housing the way HUD says we got to do housing. Do we? Do we? Do we have to, you know, rely so heavily on uh, state or federal funds that they dictate what we do with them and, and, how, we, and, and how we address our problems? Or do we start to, again, look for oftentimes <laughs> more economical solutions, but systems that, can, that, that we can bring forward from the past? I'm not saying we go backwards. I'm saying we go forward. But let's do some things that are a little more culturally appropriate. I mean, what, what I see happening on, on a lot of our territories is, is a heavy-handedness, and, and it ebbs and flows, I've, I've, I've seen territories that, that had police forces that no longer. In fact, I think the Seneca Nation actually had a, tried to have a police force at one time. Now they have marshals that are, that are kind of like, you know, community, you know, servants, peacekeepers, I guess. Um, but their, their roles are, very, are not very clearly defined. Even the relationship between the Seneca Nation marshals and, and the outside police, it's, there are more questions than answers associated with that. You can't even get a straight answer on whether whether a cop can uh, can pull over pull you over on Seneca territory, write you a ticket, and then have you go to a court outside of you know off the territory. I mean, how do they determine that that some portion of Cataraugus is in the town of Brant? It's not, but for court purposes, we're going to say it does. You know, or or Irving or or, or Gowanda or you know or whatever. I mean, some of that's absurd, and we don't address it. We, we, we don't rid ourselves of those systems. We don't even find a, a, a path around it. And, and look, we don't need people, you know, doing 90 miles an hour down the highway here, you know, or, you know, or people being reckless, whether it's, you know, how they conduct themselves on their ATVs or in their, or in their, in their vehicles or whatever else. I'm not suggesting chaos. But is there, is there a different system that we could use that's going to be more community-based, something that's more restorative, uh, more of a restorative justice kind of system than, than a punitive one? I, I say yes. But, but again, how do you implement that? When you consider the governing system that here is, is, uh, is done under a constitution that's somewhat modeled, it's not an Indian Reorganization Act uh, constitution, but it's still, it was, it, it was crafted by, by a bunch of church people that, that said, okay, the, the old chief system, which it shouldn't have ever been, should have been a clan system, but that had devolved into a bunch of um, a, a patriarchy where men thought they had the power uh, based on, you know, bastardizing the Guyana or the Goa. 
And so we said, well, they uh, they tried to sell out the land, so uh, and they did some things wrong. So they threw the baby out with the bathwater and then developed a, a constitution that doesn't get it done. And I'm not just criticizing the Senate Nation. I'm like, none of these elected systems are uh, are very, quote-unquote, democratic. But you know what? <laughs> I hate to say it, but all and not one of these communities that claims to be traditional whether it's Tonawanda, Onondaga, Tuscarora, they aren't. Whatever, what they've got going on there oftentimes uh, is, is, is about as far away from the Guyana de Goa as any elected system is. You know, and, and it isn't just about bureaucracy or, you know, trying to overcome inertia. Or, or, and, and it's not even about corruption. I mean, some of it is. It, it's about not involving the people. And, and part of that is the people not getting involved. I mean, you know, when you talk about abuse of authority, abuse of authority comes, uh, comes two ways. One, you could, you could have somebody who, who clearly tries to abuse their, their, their position and tries to assert more authority than they, than they were ever given. The other is when the, the broad public says, it's your job, you do it. And then criticize when somebody does it. I mean, if, if, if the people aren't involved in, in whatever that process is, including the process of decolonization. You can't elect somebody to decolonize you because elections are a colonial, are, are a colonial thing. We have to consider a path forward that, that brings, and look, and, and I, I'm not saying we go backwards, but brings some of what, we've, what we know of our past forward. We were evolving people. We didn't, we didn't stay in one place. You know, even the formation of the, uh, uh, you know, of, or, or the reunion of the five nations under the Guyana de Goa was, was part of an evolutionary process. We had been united before. And, of course, we, we had devolved into, you know, uh, you know um, a lot of conflict. But that um, effort to, to reunite, you know, th that the Gondawida and Hayawenta played a role in and others – was just uh, one of the times that such a thing happened. And from that time, we developed, we, we continued to develop in terms of process. You know, what, what we would, uh, if we were honestly doing um, Guyana or Goa uh, recitals the way we were supposed to, we would know that, that yes, we, we added rafters to that longhouse as we've gone along. But we would also try to be careful that we don't let the influence of uh, of the other forces change things. I mean, uh, you know, and I, I make an example when I talk about funerals. The difference between talking about our loved ones returning to our mother, as opposed to go, you know, um, making their journey to the sky world to be with the Creator. That's Christian stuff. There, I mean, and I, look, I'm not even condemning. I'm just saying that that's what that is. In our way, we talked about we talk about the faces that come from the ground and that our loved ones who return to their mother. That's what we talk about. All right, hey, we're at the bottom now. We'll take a break and, uh, and go back. But I, I want to go more on this. I want to talk about the things that that are not decolonization that people think are, and and I'll talk a little bit more about that when we come back. This is John Kane. This is Let's Talk Native. All right, thanks for coming back. This is John Kane. This is Let's Talk Native. And we are talking about decolonization, but before that, I uh, get back into it. Let me, uh, again, I want to thank my sponsors. I want to thank Ross and Holly John and the RJE family of businesses, uh, Eric White and ERW Enterprises, um, Grand River Enterprises, and uh, Native Wholesale Supply. I want to thank those in particular because they uh, are the ones who do something every week or every month to help us uh, continue the program that we're doing here. And, uh, and, and without them, uh, we, we'd be in a world of hurt. Now, I also want to thank those of you who on occasion will, will drop a check in the mail or perhaps do a, a PayPal donation. You can find our PayPal link on our, on our website. You can look. There's a lot of information on our Let's Talk Native 
uh, com uh, website, uh, including, you know, links to podcasts, uh, the videos, uh, our uh, links to our store where you can, as you see behind me, the shirts that we, uh, uh, that Jake and I've worked on to try to, um, uh, you know, let somebody make a statement with some clothing and at the same time support uh, Let's Talk Native. So you can go to our store page, which uh, w where we produce these shirts uh, with uh, uh, with Teespring as a as our printer, and you know, check them out and uh, and pick up a shirt. And, 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 and you know what? If you do so, uh, send us a picture, post it on Facebook or something. We we, we love to add you to our gallery. So uh, by all means, do so. Uh, we we greatly appreciate it. Um, all right, talk about decolonization. Here's the things that that I think sometimes get missed. We can't talk about decolonization and still talk about voting in their elections or, um, you know, being a part of the We Count, uh, you know, campaign associated with the census. Now, look, whether you vote or whether you get counted in the census or not, I mean, uh, it, 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 it's, it's hypocritical. But even <laughs> whether you do or whether you don't, Let's be clear that voting in that system and being counted is not decolonization. I mean, it, it's just simply not. I mean, it, it is it is engaging in the system that we know doesn't work for us. And it's funny, like I said, I had my, my friend um, uh, Leon uh, Sue on with me in, in New York. And there in Hawaii, they have a, a challenge because unlike here, we don't represent a large enough voting block in any district to, to have any impact unless there's a somehow an election that's a, a, almost a complete dead heat. And we can get Native people to vote as a block, which neither one of those things happens. I mean, it's rare that, that our numbers, uh, Native vote can tip a scale one way or the other. Partially because they're, they're usually not that close around our territories. And the other thing is we don't vote as a block. Native people are split uh, left and right, Republican or Democrat, if, if you will, um, as, as white people are. In fact, black people probably vote more on the Democratic side than Native people do as a percentage of population. And whether you think that's right or wrong, I'm not even, I'm not even making a judgment of that. That's just, just an observation. But in Hawaii, they have the numbers that they, they could influence elections. The, the challenge ends up being is for some of these these folks that are, uh, that are what they, I guess, for lack of a better word, are pro Hawaiian kingdom as opposed to pro, you know, Hawaiian in the state of uh, in the state of Hawaii or or the what they call the Fed Wreckers, the ones who want to be recognized as an Indian tribe, subordinate to the laws of the United States and, and the state of Hawaii. Um, you you get stuck in the, into this in this strange place. What it's funny thing is Leon was explaining to me what he does. He actually registers to vote every election. He registers to vote. But he, when he's asked if he's a citizen of the United States, he says, no, I'm a sub, I'm a, he calls himself a Hawaiian kingdom subject. And, he, and when he asked if he lives in the United States, he says, no, I live in, in, the, in the kingdom of Hawaii. So they reject his, uh, his voter registration each, each time. I think, you know, the idea of Native people saying, oh, yeah, I'll try to vote in your election. But, but be clear, I don't live in the United States. I live on Native territory and I'm not a U.S. citizen. I, you know, I think... That makes it more of a state, statement than actually voting. Being rejected, having your, your, your voter registration rejected is uh, because you, you filled, out, uh, it, it filled it out honestly is more significant than, than, than voting in the first place. Now, I, and I'm not saying that, that we should vote in their elections anyway. Because, again, we don't tip their scales um, one way or the other. We don't vote as a block. You know, again, we have look at all the native people that 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 are religious and who are more geared towards the religious right. Look at all the native people who who are into the military service and are are more geared towards the 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 right leaning you know veterans associations. I mean, the politically active native people. Oh, they're they're all hup hup dem Democrats. Oh, we love Obama. Yeah, there, there's all that, but I'm not even sure that that that, that I don't think they, that's even the majority. Again, a lot of noise made out of Deborah Hallen and Sharice David uh, being uh, elected into Congress, but there were already Native people in Congress. They, they didn't look very Native, but they, they, were, they were men from Oklahoma, and they were Republicans. In fact, there's a couple of Native women who are, are, who are still, in fact, another one from New Mexico, I think, 
that's hoping to run uh, and, and get elected into, into Congress as a Republican. See, nobody, you know, in, the, in all of the websites and all the Facebook group pages, nobody promotes the, uh, the Republican candidate. So whenever it tells you, oh, go out and vote, look, if you're being told by a Native person to go out and vote, they probably mean go vote Democratic. Because, you know, the, uh, that's, uh, there, there's this belief. So whether you're talking about a Suzanne Harjo or, or any of these other folks that, that are out there advocating, when, when Oren Lyons goes to, the, goes to NCAI and tells people to vote in the, in the 2018 elections, he wasn't telling them to, 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 to vote Republican. But they won't come right out and say, it. no, your vote matters. No. <laughs> well, if half, if half Native people are voting for Republicans and half are voting for Democrats, then it's a bit of a wash anyway. And you know, it's worse than a wash because it's assimilation. It's subjugation. It's us doing the opposite of decolonization. Again, let me say it again. Decolonization is not about finding comfortable places within the systems of oppression. It's about dismantling those systems. It's, it's not about working their systems to give us something. It's not about working their systems to get us a little bit more money from the state or the federal government. Because that's not decolonization. That's, that is colonization. That is yielding control, giving control to the state and the federal government. Look, I realize that poverty is a big problem on a lot of our territories. And you know, there's, there's some places that have casinos and, and other means for for generating revenue unfortunately some of them are some of the very things that we're fighting against mineral extraction oil gas coal navajos i mean uh mining coal so when i look at these at, at this we've got to make some decisions about quality of life now Again, my, one of my friends here uh, on, said, well, there's no problem with Congress passing laws to help with missing and murdered indigenous women or the state. They don't need to. It's already illegal to kill somebody. Enforce your goddamn laws. There's nothing that happens to our people in, in this regard that's legal. They just don't enforce anything. So to ask Congress to pass a special law like Indian Child Welfare Act, let us control our children. I don't need the federal government trying to micromanage from, from a top-down standpoint on how to protect our women. I need them out of the way so we can protect them. We need the federal government to stop, uh, stop trying to impose their taxes, their controls over economy, stop trying to steal money from, uh, from gaming re revenue so we can use the resources to do the things we need to do on our territories. And, and you know what? We also need to do uh, as native people is to is to reach out and help each other. Look, if you've got a wealthy gaming uh, group here and an impoverished gaming group here, there's no reason why there isn't uh, isn't better uh, resources to help each other. You know, sometimes it's just a function of taking somebody out of their uh, their circle of friends. So the idea of sending you know somebody from from California out here. Uh, from a native territory to here or from here to there and try to create a little bit different dynamic, not to change somebody's identity, but just to put a break on, uh, on what has been the, the lifestyle choices. Look, if we have people who want to leave because for whatever reason, they're, they're uncomfortable on their, in their home territory. We should encourage them to go to another native territory, not to continue bad behavior, but to start fresh, we should provide that community to community. We should have, we should be doing this. But you know, one of the things that stops us from doing this is the fact that we have the federal government and the state governments that, that are always trying to interfere in everything we do that is, that is connected to, uh, you know, especially the economic development. Criminalizing the things that we do, whether it's tobacco or cannabis or, or, or whatever, criticizing and, and criminalizing even some of the cash-based businesses that we do. I mean, we live in a world today where, uh, where so many countries are, are trying to go cashless. Now, why is that? It's about control. It's about something else also. It's about economies 
that are that are no longer based on actual currency. Currency that has some sort of backing. If if you can do everything cashless, you can do everything just on a computer. There doesn't even have to be real money there. It's it's just about transferring electronic data, which to me is pretty dangerous. And as a native person, I'd like to know that I've got something. Look, I'm not saying that that I'm 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 stuck with this idea of, of money or dollars, but but at least we know that they are backed by something. It, it is a, you know it. It's a promissory note of some sort. I'm not sure how much of it is, uh, how much of a promissory note I have when when something's just you know a, a, a dollar value placed on a on an app on my on my phone. But again, because many of our territories are not so comfortable with the banking systems and the electronic and the e-commerce, and even to the extent that we've used e-commerce. We found ourselves vulnerable. We we uh, look because because we're dealing in, in in a product like like tobacco or otherwise that that has a um, a lot of um, cash transactions. Also, we get put under under the microscope like like we're terrorists, like we're hiding money, like we're moving money illegally. We we've been scrutinized for money laundering just because we're we're more of a cash based system. So we get criminalized even when the thing that we're doing isn't criminal. The way that we, we conduct our businesses, for us to do something distinct from the way the state does it, I mean, people don't realize, but if you've got $10,000 on you, they literally can take that money from you and then make you prove where you got it from. There's this whole thing called civil forfeiture where, where police can take stuff and you've got to prove that it's yours legitimately. I mean, they've got, they've got cops driving around in vets that they took from drug dealers and um, houses, boats. I mean, all kinds of stuff. I mean, <laughs> I've heard, heard stories of, of, of precincts that have, you know, uh, espresso machines and stuff like that that, they, that they've taken from quote-unquote drug dealers. But you don't know that. All you know is that they, they, they seized property and then just keep it. And because if you can't prove once they've taken something, I mean, it, 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 I know this sounds crazy, but but it's true. Look it up. Look it up. Look up civil forfeiture. Eric Garner, the guy who was uh, uh, who was killed by uh, by uh, New York State Police or New York City Police NYPD in Staten Island, he wasn't selling Lucy's at the time. Nobody's even clear why they were there to arrest him and why they grabbed him. Other than the fact that he broke up a fight. But the fact of the matter is, they had seized money from him multiple times. They had thousands of dollars that they had t just, just taken from him because, uh, because they can. Under civil forfeiture laws. And see, for us as Native people, we always have to be a little bit cognizant of that. Because it even, isn't even just the idea of them taking cash. Look... <laughs> I remember when a whole bunch of uh, merchant accounts got uh, got seized, and and we had people who spent thousands of dollars trying to free that money back up. Some of it never even came came back. So <laughs> when people say, "Well, you know, maybe the federal government needs to do something," we're missing emerging indigenous women. No, how about we have less federal government on our territory? How about we have less uh, state government on our territory? How about Andrew Cuomo? Why don't you steal more money out of your casinos? Oh, that's right. You're already doing that. What, what, I think I just saw that in the news uh, that uh, uh, Hamburg uh, Fairgrounds, they're, they're, the Racino there, they're not going to give the county as much money they gave them before so, because the state's going to keep it. So not only are they trying to steal more mo steal money from, from the Senate, they're trying to steal from their own gaming. They're trying to you know, renege on their, uh, their obligations to the local communities, even on those things. And you know what? I'm not trying to dismantle that system of oppression. That's on you folks to do that. You folks can can deal with that. You white folks that uh, that thought that those uh, that gaming that was going to compete against native gaming it was going to put some money in your community. Yeah, yeah. How'd that work out? How's that working for you? But that's your battle. My battle is trying to keep the state and the federal government out of our territories. I don't want you to fix our missing and murdered indigenous women. I want you to enforce your. You know what? The drug problems we have in our territory. 
you know it's coming into our territory. You know who the drug dealers are, and, and, and you state police, Bureau of Criminal Investigation, you guys just look the other way. Even when we've had overdoses and stuff like that in this territory, you knew where it came from and did do a goddamn thing to stop it. So, no, I don't need you to come in here and raid a bunch of native, territory, native houses on our territory. How about you bust the people that are bringing the drugs in? I, you know, this is a rocket science, but there's a reason. There's a reason that happens because you'd rather have that drug, those drugs come here than go to Lancaster, go to Depew or Amherst or Williamsville. No, you, you'd rather have, have the stuff come here. The alcoholism problem that exists on native territories didn't happen in a vacuum. That alcohol was brought into our territory. Just like crack cocaine was brought into the black communities, alcohol was brought into our territory. Um, uh, some of the, the sex slave trade, where our women are picked up, that's what you, you folks do out there that's illegal. We don't need you on our territory. We need you to enforce the laws against your own. But we also need you to realize that if we catch somebody doing something in our territory, we have the right. No, we have the obligation to assert whatever justice we, we deem necessary. But the reality is, the reason that so many um, uh, crimes are committed by white men against Native women is because there's an enforcement problem. Because Native even to the extent that there are native police forces or law enforcement or peacekeepers, the federal government prohibits us from doing anything to, to a white man committing a crime against a native woman. And you know, the, and the only examples that they do under the, the Violence Against Women Act, you know what they did? They said, well, we're going to do a few test cases. We'll, we'll create a couple of pilot programs where we're going to allow this territory, this territory, and this territory to prosecute crimes against white men. But you know what? This territory, this territory, that territory, they're essentially deputized police forces. They aren't unique or distinct native solutions to the problem. No, they're only going to give that authority to something that looks just like them. So they won't recognize our sovereignty. No, they'll only recognize when they've been able to extend their sovereignty to us, their sovereignty to us. That's not decolonization, folks. That's colonial rule. And just, I mean, again, I'll, I'll, I'll defer to Hawaii. When I look at some of the conflicts, and they weren't violent conflicts, but when I looked at the, some of the battles at Mauna Kea, when I realized that the, the, how many Native Hawaiian people wearing that Bureau of Land Management shirt uh, uniform are the ones who, are, who are, are, are trying to enforce Hawaiian federal law and Hawaiian state law against the Hawaiian protesters. Decolonization is when, is, is when we don't sign up for those jobs. And you know what? The police, they love that, right? They, they love it when they can get a couple of native people in there, in their police force, so they can throw them out of the front line every time there's a native conflict. And they're not, they're, they're as diplomats. They're just there as, as, uh, as pawns. Again, I, this is a, when we talk about decolonization, we have to, we have to understand that it isn't just about mirroring what they're doing and creating a native version of the state or a native version of a municipality or a native version of the United States. The Indian Reorganization Act, that was about trying to get native territories to bail on traditional government and adopt a constitution that the United States would help them develop. And they'd, they'd be reorganized under federal law. That's what the Indian Reorganization Act was. And it was about defining what a native person was. Or let me take it back. It was about redefining what a native person was. Because the current definition at the time wasn't working. Because it didn't work when they try, when they passed the 14th Amendment, they realized, yeah, we, we, you know, Native people aren't a part of this. When they passed the Indian Citizenship Act in 1924, that was illegal. 
And they found out that uh, not everybody was buying into that, into that system. I listen to Native people say all the time, oh, well, we didn't even become U.S. citizens in 1924. Why do you even say that? Why would you say we didn't become U.S. citizens until 1924? We didn't become U.S. citizens. They declared we were U.S. citizens wrongfully, illegally. In fact, let me say it again. Denationalization, the idea of stripping somebody's national character and, and, and planting a, a, a colonial empire's uh, national character upon a people, was de it was designated a war crime in 1919, five years before the Indian Citizenship Act. By, by 1945, by the time the UN is, is, is starting to you know, be assembled, they changed this idea of denationalization being a war crime to genocide being a war crime, which incorporated not just the concepts of, of stripping away somebody's national character, but it also included killing people, sterilizing people, taking children away, assimilation, creating the conditions by where, where people would cease to exist. Some of, some of the agents of oppression are our own people. You know, I, I post every every time election goes around. I, you know, I, I create a sticker with an American flag on it. Here, and it's, here's the sticker for Native people to wear. Here's, I just voted. I just um, contributed to the uh, to my oppression. I just voted in the new agents of my own oppression. That's that's the sticker a Native person should be writing or wearing after they vote. Because even if you voted in a Native person, they are now your agents of oppression. Because, you know, Deborah Hallen, Sharice David, they, didn't, they haven't voted anything other than the, the party line for the Democrats. And anybody who thinks that, that it's only the Republicans who have passed legislation against us, you weren't paying attention. You didn't pay attention to Standing Rock. You didn't pay attention to the Keystone XL pipeline. You didn't pay attention to, to much of what the Democrats... We got a Democratic governor trying to steal a billion dollars from the Seneca Nation right now, today. It's not just the Republican governor in Oklahoma doing it. No, it's the Democratic governor in, uh, in, uh, in New York. Our problem isn't the right or the left. Our problem is that the United States is still trying to assert colonial rule on our territories. And we don't know what decolonization means. Again, it's about untangling ourselves from those systems of oppression. And like I said, it's not an all or nothing proposition. Let's, let's grab the low hanging fruit. I mean, I, I, I say the same thing about people who want to criticize um, a, a tribal government, traditional or otherwise. For those of you who think you have to like topple the whole system, no, how about you just address the inequities? If there's something the state's not doing or is doing that's not ineffective, then create a system that, that is effective. Make them irrelevant. If there's something that you think your tribal government's not doing, then create a grassroots movement to address that problem. Don't give them the sole and exclusive authority to, to solve a problem. Because the, the reality is they're, they're probably not going to solve it. The only thing the state and the federal government and oftentimes tribal government has that, that, the, that the rest of us may not have is money. But money isn't the solution. Granted, Having some financial resources makes the implementation of a, of a new system to address a problem easier. But if, the, if you have to take that money and then use the system that comes along with that money that, that, that's dictated to you, then you're, then you're just continuing the systems of oppression. That's just the bottom line. So again... I'm, I, I realize that, I, that I'm offered a lot of criticism here. But what I'm saying is we have to, as, a, as, a, as Native people, and I'm not saying as nations, I'm just saying as people, as, as families, as communities, we need to look at solutions that even if it's small groups of us can address. Look, if we save a life of a child or a life of a, of a, of, of a young woman, who might otherwise just be another statistic on the missing and murdered indigenous women's list? 
If we save anybody, a young man, a young woman, somebody who's, who's battling substance, if we save them with, with just a small group of us, or maybe even just one individual does it, that's untangling ourselves from the systems of oppression. Because their systems haven't worked. You know, again, I, I got to bring up the, the heroin um, and the opioid problem. It wasn't until it became a problem for white people that they all of a sudden said, you know, we need to be concentrating more on treatment than punishment. They had no problem locking up a hell of a lot of black people and a whole lot of native people, a whole lot of Mexican and, uh, and Hispanic people for all kinds of drug crimes. And, and oftentimes just because of use, not dealing, but just but use and consumption. But once heroin uh, and, and the opioids and, and fentanyl started getting into white communities, oh, we gotta, we've got to provide treatment now. Now you'll call it a disease. You weren't calling it a disease. What, I mean, you didn't look at, at a native person and say, oh, that person's suffering from a disease. No, he said he's a drunken Indian. We need to address our own problems. That's, a, that's a, the solution. That's decolonization. Is, and that's, I guess that's my message. So for those who asked, asked for a show, that's my message for now. Let's further continue the conversation. I want to thank you guys for listening. I'm John Kane. This is Let's Talk Native. And we'll see you on Tuesday. Yahweh.